chasing after dark. Only with the Indiana Storm Chasers. So on this episode, we have a gentleman with us. Um, he's been all over the chase community and meteorology community. Um, he's worked at the Weather Channel. He's had a hand in Radar Omega, I believe. Um, he's been awarded the gold medalist of storm chasing, actually. <laughs> so, Mike, good to have you with us. Mike Phelps. Hi, Ryan. Hi, Tia. Hi. How you doing tonight, Mike? I am doing good, but I'm the original. I'm the original Michael Phelps. <laughs> you know, I, I, can't, I can't call him a cheap imitation because he's not cheap. He's very expensive, but I am the original Michael Phelps. <laughs> <laughs> So go ahead and uh, tell us about a little bit, a little bit about yourself, um, and maybe segue into what what kind of fueled your uh, storm chasing passion. What began everything? Mm -hmm. Well, let's go all the way back. Um, my passion started uh, when my family and I were headed to Kansas City to see my uncle when I was seven years old, and we had a tornado drop down probably a hundred yards off to the left of the vehicle, off in a farm field. And my dad had to jump out of the vehicle and lash down some stuff, even that it was starting to come off the top of the vehicle because we were we had put some stuff up there to transport. And it was a very dramatic scene. His shirt was flying. His hat flew off. Dust was just pelting the side of the vehicle. <laughs> it was incredibly dramatic. And... Um, Ah, I was hooked after that, that, that whole thing. And then just the very next winter, we uh, ended up in a blizzard in Oklahoma and got stranded on the interstate for nearly 24 hours. Oh, wow. And that was crazy. So both spring and winter weather, because of those two events, have fascinated me since I was seven. And that's what got me going. That's what got me interested. But then, you know, so, you know, I when I went through school, even though I had that passion in weather and was even storm chasing as soon as I got my car in 1981, I didn't even know I was storm chasing. I don't even know if the word existed back then, but I was out, you know, tracking storms near my, you know, community of Wichita, Kansas. Um, you know, I went into the college, though, you know, at Wichita State, I didn't go to OU because we couldn't afford it. I couldn't afford it. My family couldn't afford it. So I went to Wichita State. Uh, university shockers and I said you know what I'm just gonna you know get a liberal arts degree in broadcast journalism and I am going to go to law school I'm going to become a lawyer and um, so I went through school got my broadcast journalism degree which got me a, a job at, at a tv station KAKE TV the ABC affiliate in Wichita Kansas when I graduated and I worked as a uh production assistant and you know assistant producer writing and 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 pulling scripts and editing video and stuff like that and then they found out um that i had an interest in weather and they um had like this immediate opening that they had to just fill and they knew that i had this interest in weather because for the time that i was there i kind of showed that interest and and helped out in the meteorology department there at the uh, station and so i got put into the morning and midday weather uh, um, cast, a uh, weather you know, guy position um, in 19, I think it was 1989 there. And I, I did that for like two years uh, and, and uh, before I even got my meteorology degree. Um, and so there I met a guy who was a real storm chaser. I had no idea what storm chasing, you know, serious storm chasing was until I met him. And that's when we started, we started going out to like Western Kansas, Texas Panhandle, Nebraska, traveling long distance for chases. And um, boy, I, at that point, um, as a storm chaser, when I started doing those longer distance chases and, you know, forecast, actually forecasting them, you know, drawing out the surface maps and everything in the morning and then drawing my target areas. I was just hooked on chasing at that point. And, um, you know, from the late eighties on, um, I was big time into storm chasing and, and still am, you know, in, in, in many ways. Yeah. The passion never dies, does it? It doesn't. It, no, it doesn't. I mean, it, it really doesn't. And, uh, you know, I look back and, and, um, 
you know, it, it was that turn of events that, 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 you know, obsession that I got with storm chasing that prevented me from going and, and getting a law degree. <laughs> I did not become a lawyer because I got hooked on storm chasing. <laughs> that is Which, you know, so I'm, awesome. I'm fine with. I'm, I'm fine with how my life turned out with, you know, as a chaser and, and, uh, you know, in, in meteorology and, and in weather. I mean, I've, I've done a lot of really cool stuff and, um, I'm kind of glad I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> So you have I no think regrets. I'm actually really glad that you're not a lawyer, also, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh Lord. Um, so yeah, uh, that kind of brings me to another question here. What was the first tornado you chased and didn't just have swing past your front porch or like your family's, yeah. you know, automobile? <laughs> right. Well, the, the first chase that I, I actually um, saw tornadoes. I mean, I chased from '81. To 89 without seeing any tornadoes. Just really? local wow. chasing, local chasing around my, my county, maybe going out a few counties. And it wasn't until I, again, that I started chasing long distance chasing that things really picked up. Um, because you can't just sit and wait for tornadoes to come to you. You kind of yeah. have to go out and really, really hunt them down. <laughs> yeah, I was, you know, as a local chaser, I was kind of sort of waiting for tornadoes to come to me and they never did. But anyway, um, it was in 89, we saw uh, three tornadoes. They were um, legitimate tornadoes up around Newton, Kansas. Uh, we called them in. Weather service said, no, nah, we're looking at radar here. Uh, you know, you're probably just looking at scud or something. And so we showed them the pictures, and we ended up getting the, the, the uh, storms. Uh, there was a publication called Storm Data back then. I don't know if it still exists, but it logged all of the tornadoes for the whole year. And we ended up sending the pictures to Storm Data, and they actually put them in the final log for the year. Um, so that was kind of neat. Um, the, the, you know, we saw these. The Weather Service didn't believe us. They, they had no clue. They said, oh, you're just those crazy storm chasers. You don't know what you're doing. We're looking at radar, and we can see that these storms can't produce tornadoes. Well, <laughs> they do. You know, oh. but we know now that, you know, oftentimes radar isn't going to pick up tornadoes. No. So it's important, incredibly important. But back then, boy, the weather service was very, very resistant to, you know, they, they love their spotter reports, but not storm chaser reports. Back then, when a chaser would call into the weather service, well, they were often just kind of ignored as, as yahoos. <laughs> and surprisingly, yeah, it's interesting how times have changed. Surprisingly, though, it's it's still I've I've ran into that myself where I make a, a yep. valid report, and I mean, yeah. I respect them a I lot. It depends but... on the it depends on who's working, right? It, some of these, I mean, you know, this is after dark, so some of these guys are kind of egotistical assholes, right? I hate to say, yeah. it, but um, you know, they they it's you know they're not going to listen to anything that's you know outside of what they're seeing. Oh, I don't see it, so right, you know. Yeah. yeah. And then when they see the pictures, they have to eat crow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Even then, you know, sometimes, unfortunately, we've noticed um, they'll try to say that it's uh, a non-rotating scud or something crazy like that. And it's like, yeah, well, your non-rotating scud just took out a barn. So right. I don't know what to tell you. But yeah, it, it is what it is. And, you know, that's um, one of the biggest reasons why we do what we do. And that's because, you know, we, we try to keep the public as safe as possible. Uh, especially but then you, you also them. have to remember that they're also getting reports of rotating shelf clouds from spotters and oh. from ch chasers. Right. Right? So they, they, the chasers aren't – some chasers out there aren't doing themselves much service, much justice by calling in these weird reports that the Weather Service just laughs at. Right. So the right. Weather Service does – they have to be careful. You know, I mean, it's a tough job. It really you is. Know, um, they have to, you know – filter through all that they don't know they don't know the chase we, we can look at a name or a report and say oh i know who that was from definitely right. don't listen to that but they have no idea who the good chasers are and who the you know the weird ones are so you know they have to be careful right it's true so segueing this into chasing uh, some more what is your favorite and most memorable chase? Or maybe you can split that into two. Like, what's your favorite chase and what's been the most memorable chase of your career? Is there a chase well, that just sticks out to you? Yeah, there's, there's two 
two memorable chases, um, two two really fun chases, and then one really memorable chase. So um, the two really fun chases were um, uh, May 31st and June 1st, 1990. Chased the Texas Panhandle on May 31st and saw several tornadoes, really amazing tornadoes around Spearman, Texas. And the very next day, it was a massive high risk from, I believe it was like the Dakotas all the way to Texas. And we ended up targeting southwest Nebraska. And that just so happened to be where the one supercell in that entire high risk blew up. Nice. And produced, you know, probably over a dozen tornadoes. I lost count. It was this tornado after tornado. There were three tornadoes on the ground at one time. That was my... That was June 1st, 1990. That was my Dodge City for all of these people that, you know, their big day was Dodge City. Well, that was my Dodge City. I saw, you know, dozens of tornadoes of all shapes and sizes and in intensities. Saw three tornadoes on the ground at one time, one of those being anticyclonic. It was just a dream day. We chased the storm all the way from northeast of McCook, Nebraska, all the way up to... um by the time it got dark, it was into southeast South Dakota, producing a family of tornadoes. The entire was a cyclic supercell that held its own all the way. It was wow. just an amazing thing. We didn't have GPS. We just had our little Rand McNally and our um, little handheld um, transistor, transistor weather radio. That was our technology back then. Um, we didn't have in, in-car radar or, or ability. We would just take roads and hope that we uh, we could keep up with it. And we had no idea what the road was going to do. Right. You know, and we just got lucky and were able to stay up with this thing for the entire time. That was a fun day at Campo, Texas, or Campo, Colorado. Um, everybody's heard of Campo. That, in my yeah. opinion, um, was one of the most amazing-looking tornadoes. It was perfect. It was out in the middle of a, a national grassland. It was moving two miles an hour. You could just sit there and watch it from very close proximity, which I did. And um, that was an amazing tornado and a great experience. And then the most memorable is going to be, you know, uh, El Reno. Oh, you were chasing El Reno? I I, I had had two vehicles packed with people. Oh, wow. And we were... um, Right there when it dropped, um, initially, pretty safe distance. We watched it with a group of other chasers. And, uh, one of our, uh, tour guests had a medical emergency. They thought they were having a heart attack. And so we had to assess their situation as the tornado was approaching. All the other chasers left. We were the only ones there assessing this person's situation, trying to figure out what to do. By the time we finally got on the road, we were on the very back end of the caravan of, of 100 vehicles um, uh, approaching uh, US-81. And um, a lot of those vehicles, in fact, all of them in front of us, turned right, which led them into the path of the tornado. And you saw you know, what happened to Brandon Sullivan and all those guys, Weather Channel That's crew. Him. Right, yeah. Um, they they were on 81 and, and drove into it. We drove left because I was at the back of the caravan. You know how you get in these caravans? You basically follow the caravan. Right. Yeah. You can't really deviate from that caravan. It's almost impossible to. So, But we were on the back end of this caravan, so we had the ability to make that decision. Do we go right or left? And we saw where that tornado was and how it was growing, and we said, you know what, let's go, let's go left here and uh, stay out ahead of it and try to – try to get out ahead of it later on. Well, we did finally make a decision to head right on Reuter Road. And right in front of us, crossing 81, as we turned onto Reuter Road, was, was Twistex. Oh, man. In their oh, uh, no. cobalt vehicle. We were the vehicle immediately behind Twistex. And they tore down that gravel road and were quickly out of sight. And as soon as I cleared the uh, stand of trees, which is to my right, I made the decision at that point to stop and, and turn back to, to Highway 81 and go over to Interstate 40. And 
you know, that, that just, um, that, that, that we were on the edge of that tornado for about 20 minutes. We saw how it behaved. We knew that it was speeding up. We knew that it was growing. We knew all of the little nuances that a lot of the chasers that were farther away from the tornado didn't know. They were just hearing reports, but we were literally on the edge of it for 20 minutes. And, um, you know, as I, as I look back on that day, um, there were probably three or four times that I could have made just the wrong call and probably cost, you know, my life and, and, you know, there were eight other lives that would have been lost possibly since we had, you know, the tour. Um, and then that final decision there on Reuter Road to turn around was, was probably, you know, I, I live with survivor's guilt on that, believe it or not, because, you know, here's Tim Samaras with all of his, his vast experience and knowledge and, and getting real close to tornadoes and, and being safe about it. And, and he drove into it and, and I turned around and it's like, you know, I think the reason I turned around is because I had intimate knowledge of how the tornado was behaving and he came up Reuter Road the whole time. So he was a good distance away from the tornado the whole time he was chasing it until he encountered it. And when they encountered it is when they got their close encounter. And I think that's why they did that. They didn't know that it was speeding up. They didn't know that it had turned northeast. They didn't know it had grown. They thought, probably like most people would, that the rain curtains, the, you, you were looking at rapidly rotating rain curtains around a tornado that may have been a mile or, mile or two away, whereas in reality those rain curtains were the actual tornado. Right. So, um, but yeah, that one was memorable for so many ways and, you know, will live with me forever. And, and to be honest with you, as a storm chaser, this is hard to admit. Um, but you know, it's, it's total honesty. It's, it's, you know, that storm, that, uh, that tornado took the wind out of my sails as a storm chaser. I mean, it hasn't been the same for me since. I mean, it's just, uh, I always have that in, in my mind and, and just the, the thrill of the chase kind of went away. A lot of the innocence went away that day. Right. And just, just the knowledge that, you know, you can, if you make just one bad call, just one poor choice, you know, it can cost you your life in these, in these tornadoes. And that's, that's, I think, important for young chasers to know and, um, understand is, you know, it's it's not like the movie. It's not like Twister and all the other movies out there. These things will kill you, um, and they'll do it in a heartbeat, and they're unpredictable as well. You know, we think we know a lot about them. As soon as we think we start getting, we start getting all cocky and, and start thinking that we can, you know, that we're invincible and that we know these things, then Mother Nature has a way of knocking us, you know, knocking us back down. So... Yeah, that was yeah. quite a day, quite a day. I remember that day very well. I was actually living out in Arizona, and um, I remember getting the reports in that uh, that Tim um, Tim's car had been found and was just completely just totaled. It was just squashed. It looked like it had gone through a wrecker. Yeah, I mean, I'm thankful that I didn't witness that. <sighs> I'm um, so glad I don't know. Did. I don't know how I would. I don't know how it would have scarred me. I'm sure it would have in a in a terrible way. I don't know if I would ever have chased after that. But um, no. you know, they were moving very rapidly. And I think, you know, looking back on this, my speculation is 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 they got into the thick of it very quickly, and and they were battling near zero visibility and wind that was coming at them from the front right. Um, and nearly pushing them off the road. They were probably doing everything they could to keep the vehicle on the road, on that gravel road. And they actually had a couple of escape routes that they could have turned left off, left off of between where I turned around and where they, the tornado hit them. But I think they were so into it at the time and in the thick of it that they didn't even, they either didn't see the turnoffs or just were so focused on trying to get out ahead of the tornado. Yeah. Um, I, I think they actually thought, you know, what they were feeling was, was just pure inflow, and they still had time 
to outrun it. And, you know, they were actually driving deeper into the tornado at the time. Yeah, and, you know, being just, in that situation. knowing that, you know, it picked their vehicle up, um, carried it, uh, pulled two of the occupants out of the vehicle. One found, what, a half mile one way, and the other person found another half mile or mile the other direction. And Tim in the vehicle, I mean, just just thinking about what they went through, it's just horrible to, to even imagine. Yeah, we had to. I, and that, that puts chasing into perspective right there for me. It really no, does. It does. It truly does. And I remember being, when we, we just knew that they were gone. I mean, but at that same time, I know that he, I know that whole team passed doing what they loved the very most. And I know that they were probably in those final moments. I, I can't even imagine what they were thinking, but I know they were fighting to get, you know, probes out and do tornado research. And they carried on, Twist X carried on in a spirit that it wasn't just for the adrenaline rush. They, they put, carried on hoping to make life better for all of us that live here in, you know, the greater tornado alley area. Absolutely. I mean, Tim was not a meteorologist. He was, no, he was like not. An in, yeah, he was an engineer, and he, he had was. this amazing mind to be able to build these. He had a very strong interest in, in tornadoes and weather, and he combined that with his engineering knowledge and made these these scientific things that were very valuable in, in terms of research for these tornadoes. And then he added a lot to that. And, you know, he was in the process of building this incredible high-speed camera that would show this incredible slow-motion detail of, of tornadoes and lightning and, and all kinds of things. And, and he never was able to really finish that out because that was the year that he was work, going to be working with that. And, um, you know, he, he added a lot to it and, you know, it's just, it's there, there's so much still to learn about these tornadoes. There really is. I mean, there's so much going on at the surface near the tornado that, that, that we need to learn. I mean, there have been attempts to gather, you know, really good data from near the tornado. I mean, we've got the tornado intercept vehicles that go in there, but they, they, they don't really have the ability. A lot of it has been, you know, kind of made for TV type stuff. There's no right. real science in it. And, you know, we need to get these probes, these, these tornado vehicles that have the ability to get really, really close to tornadoes and, and in within them really equipped with high, high quality equipment to record everything going on you know, near the tornado, not just the gimmicky stuff that looks good on TV. Yeah, I, think, I absolutely you know, agree. There's a lot, lot to, uh, to learn still. That's absolutely, that's so true. You know, and that kind of, that kind of brings me, I guess, down into, oh, there's so many more questions that kind of segue off that. And you've answered so many questions that I had for you. Um, Let's let's kind of jump real quick and kind of off the beaten path real quick. Um, do you talk to me more about uh, you know Stormscape TV and, and Radar Omega? Talk to me a little bit about the science behind if there was science behind Stormscape TV and of course the science behind Radar Omega. There's definitely science behind Radar Omega. Oh, yeah, for, there is, um, there. Storm, yeah, Stormscape Live TV, which was my live streaming um, that I did for many, many years. Um, that was more of me just wanting to share with the general public my passion. I wasn't out there making money doing it. Um, I wasn't selling my video or my streams to the media. I was just out there shooting high quality, doing live, high quality live streaming. Um, on the various streaming platforms that were available and just, just to share, you know, my passion. And what I did that was unique with Stormscape Live, uh, TV was I would start the stream as soon as I left my, uh, residence and leave it on all day. So you would get to see the whole evolution of the day as the atmosphere changed. You'd get to hear every last conversation I had. I would, do what I called stream of consciousness, consciousness narration. So as everything that would come to my mind, I would verbally articulate to the, to, to the viewing audience, um, as I was driving. Um, 
every thought that I had, every idea that I had, I would, I would articulate it. And, you know, that became incredibly successful and popular because, you know, people could see the real, I mean, our slogan, our little motto is bringing the reality of weather to the world. So they got to see the reality of storm chasing, not just what they were seeing on the Discovery Channel, which right. was, you know, the, the chopped up, uh, you know, edited great scene version. They got to see the good, the bad, and the ugly. And there was plenty of that to be seen. And, um, and I didn't mind showing it. I mean, some of it was embarrassing. Some of it was kind of raw and, and crazy, but it was, that was chasing. And I think people really took to that. They got to see the real, what it was like to be a real storm chaser out there, um, just on a daily basis tracking these storms. And I had a lot of fun with that. It was highly popular. I, I, I oftentimes, you know, think I'm going to kind of come back for a reunion tour and do it again one of these years, and I probably will. But right now I'm involved in, as you mentioned, Radar Omega. And that, that was an interesting uh, thing. Don Murray, who basically has, has started the whole Radar Omega, um, came to me about five years ago and said, Mike, I got all these ideas um, about, you know, things that I want to do, and I'd like for you to be involved. I, I, I need to pick your brain. I need your thoughts and ideas on a lot of this stuff. And for five years, you know, we, we you know, threw stuff back and forth and tried different things and different products and, Got involved with, you know, a, um, you know, a, a storm damage and restoration business, which is, has been very helpful in, in funding a lot of our, uh, our ideas. And, um, that, that, that company, Storm Damage Services, um, has been extremely helpful to us and, and we've been helpful to them. And, and it all kind of evolved and turned into this, um, great weather app that, we came out with here, you know, over the last year called Radar Omega. And, you know, it's, it's similar to Radar Scope and other radar apps, but it's not just a radar app. It's, it's, you know, everything that Radar Scope pretty much offers, but also for the premium services, you get, you know, satellite, you get overlays, which is on the basic product, you get overlays of, of the uh, convective outlooks and the, and the, uh, the hurricane outlooks and, and things like that and tracks of the storms, hurricanes. And, you know, it's this really cool app. And now we're starting to develop products, um, research products, like our very latest one is, is called Project Mesovort. And it's this instrument pack with a, a live streaming camera that we place, you know, in the track of hurricanes where they landfall. We also have our vehicles. Um, uh, equipped with that. It's me and Don Murray and, 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 uh, Reed Timmer. We all have these instrument packs in our vehicles as well. And we're gathering this, as I said, you know, we're doing it for hurricanes now, but we can do it for tornadoes as well. Um, this really close, important, critical data from areas that most people can't get to, especially with the pods that we place. You know, those are definitely put out in areas where humans can't be, and it's gathering this incredible data. And with Hurricane Laura, uh, which was almost a Category 5, uh, we were parked out in a parking lot of a Loves um, just to the west of uh, Lake Charles, Louisiana, and we rode out that hurricane and got amazing data from the um, eye wall of the hurricane. You know, we all, we know that these meso vortices are within the eye wall and they're usually within that inner eye wall right before you get to the actual clear eye. And we right. were just positioned perfectly where we were at to be hit by about a dozen of those meso meso vortices. And each time one hit, we got this high quality data of the uh, pressure just bottoming out. And it would spike up and then bottom out and then spike up. Amazing pressure data, amazing wind data. Um, the cars were, were, I mean, these, these things are literal tornadoes within the hurricane. And we were just rocked. I had two of my windows blown out. Um, but it was, it, it was to get, you know, it was for the science, you know, and, it, and it's nice to be able to do that. Um, you know, again, we think we know so much. We have so much to learn, and, and I'm excited to be developing 
and helping with the development of some of these new products um, that are helping to, uh, you know, shine a light on, on things about hurricanes and tornadoes that, 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 that you know, we didn't know about because there, there's plenty out there that we don't know about these storms that we still need to learn. These mesovortices have always been kind of a mystery. Boy, you can see them in the, you can see them on satellite in that eye, but in most cases with these incredibly intense hurricanes, nobody's ever really gotten that data from in there. And we were able to do that. I'm excited. We're going to probably be, you know, um, sharing that data here in the, in the coming weeks and months. There's a lot to decipher. But uh, Don, I know, is pretty excited by uh, by the science there, and so it's it's nice. I mean, I've been on both sides. I've I've been on the, just the fun, enjoyable storm chasing, doing it because I just love weather, no science involved, just out there to enjoy the storms. And then I've also done, you know, the science part of it, which is also equally, uh, you know, satisfying. So that definitely was enlightening. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I kind of was always wondering, because I've, I've used both. You know that I've used both, and I talked to you, you know, in the past about Radar Omega, and I also have Radar Scope. So I'm really fascinated with the fact that Radar Omega is now very much geared continuously towards research, um, where I'm really not sure what's going on with Radar Scope. But I, I don't think that they're so much into the research aspect as they are um, just outfitting folks with, with decent radar. Um, yeah you know, as best they possibly can. And Radar Scope has always been, like, the go-to. Um, yeah. So with Radar... I have, okay. I have nothing but good things to say about Radar Scope. Oh, yeah. I used them for many years, and I used them in conjunction with Radar Omega for a while until I just became so familiar with using Radar Omega, I just stopped using Radar Scope. I didn't stop using them because I thought they were bad. It's just I no. became a lot more familiar, and I, I enjoyed the products more than I was able to get off of Radar Omega. People always say, well... Why should I do that when I can just get this data for free off the Internet? Well, you can, but it's not quite the same. And it's also nice to have it all in one place and to be able to overlay a lot of that stuff onto the actual radar or satellite image is pretty cool. You know, we developed, when we were develop Radar Omega, we did it, you know, you know, I'm a storm chaser, Don's a storm chaser. So we, we, we knew what storm chaser would, would want in a product, and, you know, we kind of added those as well. Uh, but yeah, they're both great products and, uh, you know, I, I'm excited by how much we've been able to accomplish in just about a year. You know, I mean, you think about it, Radar Omega has not been around very long. And, and no, it now hasn't. we have, have developed what I feel is probably one of the best weather products, uh, weather apps out there. Um, if not the best, I think it's the best, but, um, and, and we've done it in about a year's time, and, and, and we're always taking people's thoughts and ideas and comments to heart and actually incorporating that into the product on a continual basis. We take what people say, well, why don't you do this? Okay, that's a great idea. We will. We have this great developer um, uh, who, who is Don and another guy, and, and, and they incorporate that. And I think that makes the product unique as well. I don't think you get that with Radar Scope. They're, they're pretty well established, so you can't just say, "Hey, Radar Scope, why don't you do this?" And then suddenly it shows up next week. No, it's but it's with, very true. Yeah, but with this product, because it is so young and so you know changing, we can we can do that now, and, and we're happy to, to to incorporate those ideas. Yep, I will actually tell you that my maiden voyage with Radar Omega was actually May 27th, 2019. And I know Ryan's thinking about it because it was definitely Memorial Day of last year. Yep. And um, Ryan and I, we didn't know each other at all, but we actually wound up on the same storms. Now, this was there was a pretty decent outbreak here in Indiana. And I we it was a brand new learning tool. I didn't use Radar Scope. I didn't use anything else that day. It was Radar Omega 100%. And the stuff, I fell in love with the app. I truly did. Um, you know, I saw several storms that day. We I have a couple gorgeous photos of a tornado that happened near Silver Lake. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it just, it's a great app. It, it does. It, it, the real-time focus on that thing is just unbelievable. Um, and yeah, I, that's I almost, awesome. I almost wonder if it performs a little faster than Radar Scope, but again, I don't have, 
I didn't have another device up to, to time it or really, you know, go back and forth between it. And I'm not going to pit one horse against another. We're not, we're not here to do that. But I will say that Radar Omega, having both of them at my disposal here, um, they're both phenomenal. But yeah, Radar Omega does seem to be gearing more heavily towards research, and research to me um, is the most important name of the game. I really could care less about a good photo- photograph or a good video. Um, at the end of the day, I care about getting people safe, and I care about getting the best information out there that's humanly possible, and, and of course, anything that goes towards um, tornado research is something that's an ace in the hole in my book. Yeah, I think the fact that we're able to incorporate live video from storm chasers into the actual app yeah. is amazing. It's incredible. And um, we're going to, in the future, build a entire mobile mesonet of storm chasers and equip them with these um, instrument packs that the three of us have in our vehicles now. We're going to have, hopefully someday, in hundreds of vehicles and create this, you know, uh, nice network of uh, information around you know, hurricanes or supercells or tornadoes that, you know, has never been done before. I mean, they've tried, you know, they've done mes- mobile mesonets, obviously, in Project Vortex and other projects like that, uh, research based from, from colleges, but never just, you know, in general uh, with just incorporating and using storm chasers. But you have all of these chasers out there. You may as well use them. Right. And it's not yeah. very difficult to put these instruments they're very non-invasive uh, invasive things you hardly even know that you've got anything on your vehicle um, you have just a little anemometer and then everything else is kind of installed inside the vehicle and um, but it's it's amazing that you can you know use these chasers and, and gather all of this data and it may as well be used um, since they're out there already and, yeah uh, that's kind of our goal and we're gonna all and all of that will be incorporated into the app so those Folks who have like the um, alpha, mega, alpha, uh, beta, or gamma versions of, of um, Radar Omega, uh, the subscription services are able to view that data in real time, which is how cool is that to be able to just see this weather data with the uh, live video? It's pretty, pretty cool. I've got to you right now, sign me up. I'll be happy to, uh, <laughs> yeah, I'll be happy to donate the Vindicator towards this. Absolutely. We'll, 100%. we'll be in contact. Add me uh, into we're that looking too. at, uh, getting folks. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Personally, yeah. I've always wondered how I can get into the research type of things because I'm with Tia. Like I'm, I'm, I enjoy going out. I enjoy having a good time, getting the thrill. But at the end of the day, um, research has been something on my mind. And while I don't have a degree or yeah. I'm not going to get a degree anytime soon, I mean, if I can benefit the community in any way, research scientifically, sign me yeah. up. I think, I'll, yeah, absolutely. And I, I think it's a lot of, uh, it's important for chasers to understand that. You do not have to have a meteorology degree to, you know, contribute in an amazing way to the research of tornadoes. I mean, just Tim Samaras is a perfect example. Yes, he is. Look what he did. Look what he did without a degree in meteorology and and we can all do that we can all contribute and it's not all about money and it's not all about being first and it's not all about getting likes on facebook or twitter or whatever and and showing off it's it's so much more than that it's it's you know about getting out there and you know seeing something absolutely incredible and then gathering data off of that as well which is going to be helpful you know for forever you know the data that we gather now because this is very we're we're still very much in the infancy of gathering information data about tornadoes the data that we gather now is going to be so useful and and it's something that will be lasting forever you know what we're doing now right and it's exciting to be a part of that even if even if you don't have a degree no, absolutely. And I mean, I think Bill Nye, you know, another another guy, I think Bill Nye, what was he, a, a mailman or something like that before he became Bill Nye the science guy. He has an honorary doctorate now, I believe, but he wasn't, he's not a scientist by, by schooling, but he's a mm-hmm. true science-based mind. Um, right, you know, and he DeGrasse, has the passion. Exactly. And even Neil deGrasse Tyson, who is, you know, an award-winning physicist, he is, you know, I mean, an incredible human being and, again, probably one of the best physicists that are, have ever walked the planet, you know, I'm right up there with Hawking, if I dare say so, 
Um, he will be the first person to tell you that if you have a passion for science and a passion for, you know, this information, it doesn't matter what you study or if you, or where you study it, so long as you study it, you know, then you can make a difference. Yeah. Um, and these guys, what sets them apart is they're great communicators, too. Yes. And so they can, they have that passion, but they can also communicate it to the public in a way that people understand. And, um... You know, that, that makes them, you know, very successful. We need more folks like that out there as well. You know? We do. But, yeah. We do. But, I mean, it kind of brings me down and it, it boils down. You said something about social media and it kind of rung a bell in my brain and kind of set the little antenna up with how things have changed so drastically in just a very short period of time um, within the extreme weather community and the storm chasing community. Um, you know, you said it yourself back in the day, you guys didn't have handheld devices that had, you know, or these smartphones that have, you know, a radar program that can help you watch a storm initiate and then you can just drive towards it. And you had to do all the forecasting for yourself in order to be able to figure it out. Otherwise you, it was a bust. It just, mm -hmm. you sat there yep. under clear skies all day. Yep. Um, Did that plenty know, of times. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. And, what kills me is that there's so many people out there right now that lack the knowledge about basic, basic thunderstorm anatomy and morphology, and they're just going out there willy-nilly with a GoPro and trying to become the next greatest thing on um, Facebook or Instagram. And they, it's like the influencer, um, God, I don't even know what I could call it. It's like the age of the influencer where we care so much more about likes and we care so much more about selling whatever footage we have that we've lost very much just the intimacy that is storm chasing. Um, I think in, in my heart of hearts, and maybe you'll agree or you'll disagree is that these, there's some of these newer chasers and these guys that are out there that are trying just so hard to promote themselves and create a brand or what they imagine is kind of like their public image, you know, and they're compelled much more about, becoming some household name in the next Reed Timmer or the next Michael Phelps or the next, you know, Tim Samaras or, or, you know, Josh Worman or whatever, that they totally forget, you know, the science. And in some, in many ways, they just, they completely disclaim the science. Um, you know, yeah. without that, yeah, it's just, it's weird. It's just, it's weird. It is. I, and I, and I think going it's back to different. Into, it's different than it was. It sure. is. And I think kind of going back into it and really sitting back down and, and thinking about it myself. I mean, I started when I was, what, 15, 16 years old. I've always loved storms. I mean, ever since I was a kid, you know, my original story is very similar to yours and in, in how I became in love with them. We saw a storm just outside of, um, oh God, I can't remember where it is in New Jersey, but it was very, very close to where Six Flags Great Adventure is. And I remember seeing it, a, 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 uh, it was just debris starting to kick up and, you know, it's very much a, a circulation in, in a dirt parking lot that we were driving past. So that just really, that was that. But I think down deep, even as a kid, I never would have tolerated all the time spent on the road and all the cold burritos and all the food poison that I've caught, you know, <laughs> with crappy, <laughs> greasy, you know, spoon restaurants and stuff. If it wasn't for my drive, to make this world a little bit better and safer for people, you know, I, right. you know, their satisfaction seems to derive only from seeing a tornado. And I think we can all agree that that only occurs in, in just a handful of chases, you know, that we're out on, no matter what the ingredients are. Right. So, I mean, how do you feel about this new breed of neophyte chasers that are just there for the Instagram likes or Facebook likes or, you know, follow me on Twitter? I love their passion. I love the fact that they're interested in the weather and storms and, and, you know, have a fascination with that and are willing to get out there and, and risk their life to, you know, see these amazing events. Um, but I do think they are kind of in a way um, kind of intoxicated by what they've seen on TV and on storm chasers and, and the glamorous side of storm chasing. Yeah. And, um, you know, because of the um, ability for us to now, you know, have radar in the vehicle, they're very successful just like everybody else nowadays because it's a lot easier now to pick the right storm, whereas back before we had in-car radar, 
you know, you had to use a lot of, um, of your knowledge and, and experience and, uh, to pick the right storm. And so it's a lot easier for them. So they're not really suffering the, you know, many busts that we may have experienced as younger chases ourselves because we didn't have that data at our fingertips. Right. It's all, it's all unicorns and rainbows for them. They go out, they see great stuff. If they're there first, they get a lot of likes and it just feeds into their, their, them, you know, just wanting to take more and more chances, get closer and closer, you know, do some things that might not be very smart. To all to all to make a buck or two, and all to get those likes on social media. So what I'm excited about with with what we're doing with Radar Omega is and potentially equipping chasers with this, um, you know, this this instrument um, is the fact that we can now turn a lot of these chasers that had been out there just for the thrill of it into actual full researchers. You know, they'll have this information in their vehicle that is gathering valuable information, and maybe it will kind of turn the tide of thought from, you know, hey, I just want to get out here and just see as many tornadoes and get as close as I can and, and get all these likes to, wow, I'm actually doing something for, for science here too. This is actually pretty cool. So, you know, maybe it'll turn. Um, I, you know, I, I, I'm not the chaser police. Everybody's out there for their <laughs> own reasons. And, um, you know, God love them. You know, everybody's doing their thing and, and the bottom line is if, if, you know, people keep saying, well, all of these yahoos out there are going to get themselves killed. Well, sadly, look who got killed. Mm-hmm. You're right. It wasn't the You're yahoos. Right. It was a very experienced chaser. They were the first to die. And, um, you know, so, you know, it, it, it's, it's interesting. It's definitely different. There's a whole lot more of us out there now than there was when I started. When I started in the 80s, it was, I was lucky to maybe run into Doswell or, or Al Mumler, maybe Warren Fahey oh, every wow. now and then. Um, yep. But that was it. <laughs> you didn't see, you didn't, you never had, you know, tons of vehicles on the road. I've had to wait 10 minutes as a, or as a tornado approaches to get pulled out into the, into the road to escape it. I mean, that's crazy. Um, it is. And so that's kind of nuts. Um, uh, I, I, there's nothing you can really do about that. I mean, it's just something we have to live with. And there's no way anybody's ever going to regulate it. Everybody said, you know, the, oh, well, when a tour company gets killed by a tornado, you know, Congress is going to come up with laws to regulate storm chasing. You can't regulate storm chasing. That's like regulating somebody's summer vacation. Right. You know, yeah, you're right. You, you really can't do that legally. <laughs> I mean, what no. people do on their, their, their spare time is what they do. So, right. you know. It's something we have to live with. But, yeah, I mean, I would be happy if if I was in some way, and I always like to be on the cutting edge of things, if I'm in some way, you know, with my association with Radar Omega, able to add to the science by getting some of these folks that are just out there, you know, uh, with other motives, actually get them equipped with scientific uh, research, and from, you know, data and information. So that'd be kind of cool. So more or less trying to entice them back from the dark side. Yeah, pretty much, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we can't mm-hmm. offer him the money that the, the media and – and that's another thing, too. Let me, let me talk quickly about this. When I was selling my video to the media, I was making, you know, $1,000, 2000 $3,000 a chase because I didn't have a broker taking half the money. And also prices were a lot higher. I mean, they, the media would pay a lot of money for this high-quality video back then. But anymore – since everybody and their dog has a has a smartphone and and just gives their you know video away to the media, the price that they will are they're willing to pay for good video because it went way down, and the brokers take you know nearly half of that anyway nowadays, and so people aren't making much money at all chasing. So it's like money is definitely not a motivation, <laughs> you know. Yeah. So uh, but yet the you know it's the prestige I guess of of getting your video on, you know. The weather channel or, or whatever um well that's, yeah. it's the you know going through a broker and we won't name any brokerage names but going through a broker is the easy out in my opinion it, it it ends the back in the day i mean i'm sure you'll say the same thing we had to cultivate relationships with these people at the mm-hmm. local news stations and stuff um yeah you know it, it, it's kind of taken that middle step out and I, I still try to do that i still always want to be friends with local ems and with local 
um, media relations. So, I mean, I guess there's the old way and then there's the new way, and some of us are just clinging to the old ways. It's like we're the old Republic, the old Jedi, so to speak. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So it is, it's, it's tough. It's really tough. And I see a lot of things like that. And it's, cause I guess I'm like from the last class of kids that, you know, the, the old kids on the block, so to speak, you know, mm-hmm. but it's, it's, it's unbelievable just how much our world has changed. And you're right. Anybody, anybody with, you know, a, a, a smartphone is going to be out there trying to, trying to take videos of these things and you know we very brian and i even very recently earlier this year we, we were in what was it almost napany oh i think the first time we saw this poor guy or i won't say poor guy the first time we saw this guy was was uh near bourbon uh indiana and then again he showed up again in the middle of nowhere in napany and uh, he basically figured out where we were and was a bit of a parasite going into these storms simply because we had announced where we were on our Zello channel. Um, and just hindsight being 2020, Chaser Convergence and people who don't know what they're doing, you know, hogging the roads and getting up, you know, chasing the tornado chaser, so to speak, I don't, it just adds a, a whole new element of danger. Because, Like you said, these things are completely unpredictable. We never know what they're really going to do and mm-hmm. just what kind of a mood they're in. If they do, they really do. I don't know, I'm not going to anthropomorphize tornadoes, but it almost feels like a lot of them have their own personalities. Yeah, I mean, the the way they behave is, uh, yeah, it, it kind of leads you to think that way. And um, and that's why there's so much that we still need to learn about that near tornado environment, what's going on right around the tornado that causes. Why does a tornado, for example, like Joplin happen? Yes. Why does a tornado like... You know, Gerald happened. They start one way and they end up a terrible way very quickly. Very, and, very quickly. You know, and, and, you know, just looking at the atmosphere, you can't, the general atmosphere, you can't really figure out why the tornadoes behave this way. But then if you are able to gather that data from, from the tornado very close to the ground up to about 30 meter, meters above the ground, there's a void in data. A lot of just, absolute void in that ground level to 30 meters up near the tornado. We need to learn what's going on there, and I think it will open up the, you know, the, the mystery to some of why, you know, as to why some of these tornadoes behave the way they do. Yep. And that will help. That will help in the long run, you know, in terms of, of warning and, and help hopefully save lives. No, I think you're completely correct. It's Sometimes we see things, even in damage, after the fact that just you know, makes you raise your eyebrows. You know, for instance, you know, whole house gets taken out, and then the dining room table is left completely alone, not an inch of debris on it, nothing. And yeah. the dinner, you know, the dinner plates are still there. It just doesn't make any sense. And I would love to know, in my right. lifetime, what makes a tornado a tornado? You know, like that just in, in the nitty gritty yeah. of it. And, we and, know what, yeah. yeah. And we all know the the video of the Weather Channel's vehicle rolling about a dozen times. Ooh, my the, Fidel, yep. The camera that fell out of the vehicle didn't roll at all. No. In fact, it didn't even move. It felt no wind. Why? No. Why? <laughs> yeah. I would love to know <laughs> so, that. I mean, there's wind at the right at the ground surface. We know that. We've seen asphalt scoured and, and you know, vegetation pulled up, grass pulled up. So we know there's wind right at the ground. Why? Did that one not expect? There's all these little mysteries. I was surveying damage in the Andover tornado back in 91, and um, that was quite a day. Uh, I, I chased, I, uh, we'll save that one maybe for another time, but that, that was my first <laughs> F5 tornado, and it was going right through my hometown. But anyway, after the tornado, I was out looking at damage, and there was like this wine cellar, and all the corks from the wine bottles were pulled out. But yet wow. the wine, the bottles, and everything in that cellar was perfectly fine. Wow. Not, not any debris or anything in there, but all the corks were out. And they say, well, it's not the pressure that causes things to explode. It's the wind. But then you see things like that. There's some yeah. pressure stuff going on, too, for right, sure. Right, that had to be pressure. Yeah, <laughs> no, know? for sure. That's the first thing I thought of. It's, it's all right. Cork route. Yeah, and so there's all kinds of weird stuff. And again... It's because we haven't really been able to get in there in a really good 
scientific fashion. We've done it, done it in a gimmicky way for TV yes. again, but uh, we haven't done it in a scientific way. I think we really need to go down that road. And people say, oh, well, the tornado tank uh, era is over. That's, that's just no, nothing not. really that you can gain from that. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, for sure. There's a lot that can be gained by these vehicles. Yes, I'd like to see a whole fleet of those things out there, man. I'd oh. love to see a fleet of them. I'd, I'd love for them to be involved with Radar Omega. You know, we actually uh, we actually reached out to the guy who has the, the first TIV now, um, mm-hmm. and he'll be a guest on our show here shortly, but maybe we'll put you guys in touch because he does have one. Right. Well, I don't want to let too too many things, uh, I don't want to give through too many things away, but um, there's a very strong possibility that I could, could have one as well, too, very soon. So. Oh, Ooh, there we go. <laughs> Ooh, you'll have to share with me later. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> so moving back into the science of things, I think you're, you were someone who was pretty, um, you knew that I was, I was fighting a, a series of wind, uh, wind farms being put in, in my local community mm-hmm. God, a couple of years ago now. Um, how does radar Omega and you as a forecaster and you as somebody who watches radar, uh, how do you guys account for wind farm signatures and radar clutter? And do you feel that wind farms pose a risk to trace chasers in the field because of these signatures? We have the ability on, on our radar, and I think other radar apps do as well, um, where you can filter out uh, some some of that. But the returns are so strong um, that you can't filter it all out, and it's there. You just have to recognize there needs to be are. like a national map of these on radar that's, that's, you know, easily posted for storm chasers to look at. Because I get people asking all the time, what is that? And if there was like a map of it that said specifically what these returns are, um, and uh, people would know exactly where they're at because they obviously don't move, and they're going to go, oh, okay, so I don't need to worry about that at all. That, that's that's wind farm stuff. That's, you know, um, ground clutter. That would be helpful, you know, just to, just to have that resource out there available. Um, you know, and I think most chasers are savvy enough, I would at least hope so, that, to know that, you know, they're not going to be fooled by that that um, that stuff there. And in yeah. terms of the, the wind farms being in danger, um, you know, I think... <laughs> I think they're only a danger for chasers looking to shoot that most incredibly unique video of being right there next to a um, windmill when a tornado hits it. <laughs> and, you know, yeah. risking their life in that in that way because you know we have had these things hit by tornadoes and it's it's pretty dramatic damage, but nobody's ever really captured a really good look at one getting hit from close no. distance. And I, I just think that, you know, they're always looking, chasers are always looking for the new thing because there's not that much new out there. Pretty no. much everything's been done, but there's a lot that hasn't. So that's one of those things that I'd be afraid some chaser is going to say someday, you know what, I'm going to hang out at this, this wind farm and just see what the heck happens with this tornado or this Yeah. No, yeah. I won't go anywhere near them. I know, like, I will... It's it's hard to say that I'll avoid communities that have them because there are tons of communities that have thought this was a brilliant idea to have them installed, you know, in their farmland. And there's tons of houses that have them, you know, less than 1,600 feet away from their house. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, for instance, there's a town, what, Gifford, Illinois, it's just over the state line in Illinois. And I show horses out that way. And there's plenty of wind farms all around the area. Well, we have, doesn't matter what carrier you have very little in the way of data. Um, and it's that data lack and, and, and also with the radar clutter that makes me very nervous when I'm out there. Mm-hmm. Um, because once a storm comes into that area with the, with the rest of the clutter, you, you, you're blind. And then, you know, with the lack of data and how it's, you know, throws signals and stuff like that, you, it's, it's a mess. So I do try to avoid them and I hate to say it, but it's, it's completely true because it, it, I feel that they're a bit of a safety risk, but what can I do? I, I'm obviously biased. Right. I had a very eerie encounter with a wind farm and a tornado um, near Lyman, Colorado. There's a big wind farm out there near Lyman. Um, this was probably three or four years ago. But we were sitting there at night 
uh, watching a storm that was uh, tornado warned, and you knew there was probably a tornado in there, but you couldn't see it. It was out in the middle of the um, plains. It wasn't hitting anything. There were no power flashes. But we watched, um, and it wasn't the rain, but we watched a very solid area of, you know, the red lights that flash on top of the, the wind yeah. farm, uh, windmills. A whole section just went black, and then it became light again. And you could see that moving, that blackness would cover the, the lights, you know, as it moved along. And you just, you knew what was out there. <laughs> I was like, wow. Oh, that's spooky. That's a little spooky that for a Halloween story. very story. eerie, spooky thing. Yeah, for Plus sure. It goes the darkness, absolutely. You know yeah. it's there. It's lurking. Oof. Yeah, and then oh, there was some you. damage that was done. And, and, you know, if you've seen these things fall apart, you know, just regular wind. There's, like, some video oh, yeah. out of one in France or something that just regular wind destroyed. Um, they just, like, the, 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 the windmill just, the pieces just flew everywhere. Yeah, I think I know what you're yeah. talking about. I think I've seen that video. Yeah, yeah it's crazy. Those, uh, those blades come become almost like lawn darts. Yes, yes. No, <laughs> the, thank the, you. The pre, the pre, uh, metal band ones. Remember they, yes. they used to be the, the metal ones that you could, you know, then they banned them and then, then, then they, they, they were made out of plastic. <laughs> yeah, no, you're right. You're absolutely correct. We would oh. throw those metal ones at our, at our friends and hit them. Nobody ever died. Oh, God. It, was, it was pretty crazy. <laughs> brutal. <laughs> that is brutal. God. So. Moving gears a little bit, uh, we talked about some of your. <laughs> we've talked about some Lord of your back to weather, right? Okay, right. We've talked about some of your positives from your career, but what is one of the biggest failures that you had in your career, and what did you learn from it? Not spending enough time with my young children because I was out storm chasing. Ooh, that's a good one. Mm, yeah, yeah. Me and. Cool. Um, for all the young chasers that are obsessed with chasing and have a family, I would uh, strongly recommend that you spend as much time as you can with your family and don't miss, Absolutely. you know, those important events because you were so obsessed with the uh, storms because the storms will happen every year for the rest of your life. And, you know, you never know when you may, you know, lose a family member or that, you know, they grow up and they, right. you know, your kids aren't around forever and you'll look back and you'll regret not spending that time with them. So, right. um, you know, I'm, I'm blessed to be able to have a lot of free time now and I spend a lot of time with my children now. Um, but they're pretty much grown. Um, and I, and I missed a lot, uh, when they were growing up and I, I, uh, deeply regret that. And, um, you know, it's just, you know, you, you don't want, it's one thing to be passionate about something, but, but try to avoid the obsession. You know, it's hard to do with chasing. It really gets in your blood, and it's hard to resist that obsession. Um, and looking back, I, I, I just, you know, I hate that I, I did become obsessed with it for, for many years, and that was all I did. And, uh, you know, I wish I hadn't, but um, now all I can do is just hopefully let folks know that, you know, try to spend more time with your wife or your girlfriend or your kids because storms are always going to be there. There's always going to be that amazing tornado next year or the year after. The year right. After. It happen every year. Even in the bad years, there's the, you know, the bad years that hardly anything ever happens. There's still an amazing tornado that happens. You'll see it, you know, maybe just not this year. And I've, I ended up, you know, kind of, taking many years, several years off in the, in the, all the years that I chased, I've taken maybe five or six years off completely just to try to spend with family. But still that's that, that in my opinion, that wasn't enough. And I did miss, especially when they were really little, a lot of, a lot of things. So. That is probably definitely... not what you expected me to say, but that, no. that one jumps out as the number one no. regret. For me. Not at all. I was expecting something and completely you know, I... different. And as a parent, it um, it really hits home. It really absolutely hits home. Um, so I think we're all kind of wondering it okay, because we've been following him now. Okay, he lived in a van the whole chase season. Kiss and tell. What's it like working with Reed Timmer? You know what? Um, I have never chased with Reed. Really? This year we were. This year we had Reed on our team. 
you know, Radar Omega team that I didn't really go out on any storms after uh, we had the outbreak in the southeast. Um, the big uh, Mississippi tornadoes were kind of the last ones that I, uh, I saw for the year, and I didn't chase because of the virus. So, um, I, you know, I'm, I'm high risk in many areas, so I, I just decided to play it safe. And, you know, do a lot of promotion and branding of, of Radar Omega from home. So I didn't get out there and chase with Reed. And Don, I think, maybe chased with him a couple of times. But Reed is, he's, um, you know, working with this new uh, project called um, uh, Category 6, which is a new program that's going to be, um, I believe it's Disney or one of those. Uh, Net Geo, I believe. You know. Yeah, there you go. Um, yeah, yep. so... Uh, He's, he's going to be involved in that as, as well as Radar Omega. And, and, um, you know, we're, we're excited to have him on board, um, helping out with, uh, with, with, you know, promoting the product and, and working with it and being equipped with, with our research equipment, you know, because he's out there all the time and, uh, you know, yes. he's a valuable person to have on, on our side. So, you know, uh, it's, it's it's really cool, and I, I, I've, I've talked to Reed a few times. I've run into him, you know, chasing, and he's a very pleasant fellow. And you know, I, I, he, he's, he's latched on to a formula that works in terms of you know uh, getting people to watch um, his chasing and, and uh, advancing his products and, and whatnot. And and some of that's not really him, you know. It's it's kind of geared toward you know helping him with promotion. Um, and he's kind of a, a master at that. So uh, he's, he's a general, genuinely good guy and uh, has a ton of passion, and he knows a heck of a lot about tornadoes and about chasing, and, and we're excited to have him with uh, Radar Omega. That is awesome. I, I've, genuinely, I've had a lot of fun watching him over the years and watching him evolve, especially mm. after Storm Chasers. And Yes. I mean, he does have, he has done a lot of maturing ever since then. Oh, um, yeah. I mean, he's grown a lot and it's, it's, it's actually a joy now being able to watch his live feed. Um, and just kind of see the master at work, so to speak. I swear he, they talk to him. It's bizarre. Yeah. Yeah. He's like a tornado whisperer. <laughs> yeah. He does. He, he has a lot so. of, he has a lot of knowledge and that's for, and, and really, a lot of people would if they were able to get out as much as he has been able to get out. I mean, what yeah. sets him aside from the rest of us is just the vast amount of time he is able to be out there immersed in the atmosphere and learning um, in the laboratory, so to speak. Not learning, yeah. you know, at home or on the Internet or whatever. He's out there learning and experiencing it, you know, firsthand. Um, so that that – and he's able to do it a lot. And that kind of yeah. sets him apart, and that I think that is why he is so successful. He's just picked up on so many things that he's witnessed over the years. I would agree. All right, so switching some segues yet again. Uh, being on the road so often as a storm chaser, uh, you had to have some experience with hotel stays. Uh, is there one, or maybe maybe many? Uh, any stays at hotels that have been absolutely horrific? I've been really lucky. Really? <laughs> I I haven't had a horrific experience anywhere. I mean, I've had pretty bad experiences. I mean, just I think like most of us have, you know, um, you know, maybe some bugs in the in the hotel room or a window broken in the in the hotel room, um, but nothing really horrible. I mean, I've had some scary situations where somebody's trying to get in my room in the middle of the night. It's always <laughs> a little bit weird, and that's happened a few times. But it's always been an accident, somebody coming in drunk or whatever. And right. You just uh, you just say, hey, wrong room, buddy, go, move, move along, and they go. Um, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> that's always really uh, shocking to me is you be waking up, woken up from a dead sleep and somebody rattling your door trying to get in violently really, really strongly. <laughs> But, um, yeah, I mean, I, I tend to stay at, uh, you know, not the really high-class places because, again, you know, you're trying to save a little money. So it's right. Super 8, Motel 6, and places like that. And uh, I've been really lucky. Yeah. And I, I marked down 
I mean, I take notes of, of the places that are really good, and I try to stay at the same places as much as I can. Um, you know, when I'm out chasing, I've got a, you know, a, a, a nice little mental catalog of all the good places, and I try to stay, you know, in those places. How about for gas stations, and what's your favorite gas station food? Mm, gas stations, just, um, you know, pretty much uh, anything that has the cheapest gas. i got a gas <laughs> buddy. So, you know, fire up old gas buddy and look for uh, the cheapest gas, food, you know, uh, convenience store. Yeah, here's the deal. I mean, nobody can eat properly as a chaser. I don't care nope. how, how much you want to stick with your diet or if you're on a special diet. It's just virtually impossible to do if you're going to be out there for a long period of time. So, you know, the, the convenience store food is not the best in the world, but at least it gets you, it gives you the energy you need to go. And a lot of times you can't just stop at a, at a restaurant or even a fast food place and grab something. So I'll oftentimes, you know, I'll have a decent breakfast and then the rest of the day, nothing is promised <laughs> for the rest of the day, even, right. I'll, even right on through dinner. So you grab convenience store food to munch on when you get hungry later. So, yeah, that's, uh, if you look at the ingredients on some of these sandwiches you get from convenience stores, there's like a hundred different things on there. It's supposed to be yeah. just ham and meat and cheese and bread, but no, there's like all these other crazy chemicals and right. things as well. <laughs> right. So I know it can't be good for you, but no, you know, I haven't died yet from it. So, <laughs> I've, I've had, I have had. A couple of instances of, of food poisoning while chasing. I think we um, all have. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, that's, that's not pleasant. <laughs> no, it's not. But it doesn't yeah. stop us either, does it? You know? No, you're right. We don't learn from our mistakes. We're gluttons for punishment. That's all the name of research. <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> well, exactly. So, yeah. We're running out of time here. Uh, just want to thank you for coming on. It's been a great, great conversation that we've been having here. Yeah, it's been fun. You have to do this again sometime. Hope you can come back with us. Uh, oh, I'd love to. Yeah, absolutely. I got plenty more to, uh, other stories to talk about down the road if you want to talk about them. I've been, <laughs> I've been actually quite humbled by your uh, conversation tonight. So, thank you for it. Um, You're welcome. You're welcome. So just to wrap up this uh, podcast, just want to remind you guys about Peak Foliage, which is coming up here pretty soon in Indiana. We'll have our map up shortly within the, probably the next couple of days on our Facebook and Twitter. Um, our next podcast will be October 18th with one of our own chasers, Caleb Ivins. Um, he is our lead forecaster. And following that, on November 1st, we'll have the uh, owner, Robert Gilstrap, who currently owns Tiv 1 from the series Storm Chasers. Uh, we'll have him on and with his future plans for what he wants to do to restore the Tiv. Um, besides that, that's uh, going to wrap it up. Uh, don't forget to subscribe, become a sponsor. Uh, you can get personal forecasts. Um, you can hit us up on our Facebook uh, for f if you have questions or anything like that. We have a fan group. You can ask or chat with one of us or submit questions. Whatever you want, uh, we can answer it for you. But um, that brings us to the end of another episode of Chasing After Dark. Uh, my name is Ryan Harry, and I want to thank you guys for listening. Uh, be sure to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and you can listen in on Zello. Uh, Tia, anything you want to add to this? Nothing, just that you can go ahead and also find us by surfing to indstormchasers.com. Again, don't forget to subscribe and receive your personalized forecast of the premium content. Unfortunately, you can't find Michael Phelps on our website. I'm going <laughs> to keep him all to myself. <laughs> so, but yeah, absolutely. Thank you guys for tuning in and, and putting up with all of our goofiness, so to speak. <laughs>